When the FX3 was first released, I posted this video to wonder why Sony called it a cinema camera when it clearly lacked many of the most basic cinema camera features. But Sony gave us the 2.0 and the 3.0 updates packed with many of these missing cinema features. So it was time for an updated video to join the hype and share the excitement with everyone. But that didn't last very long. After testing the latest 3.0 update, I found that almost every cinema feature Sony added had a major quirk or limitation that sucked away this excitement. In this episode, I'll go for a deep dive into all these new cinema features and I'll show you everything right and wrong with each one of them. I'll also tell you about the two major features that Sony completely skipped in this update. As for ProRes RAW shooters, I'm sad to say, you won't be very happy with this update. Let me explain. <laughs> Before I start, I invite you to watch the first episode about the FX3 claim being a cinema camera. Not only because it has a lot of details I'll be skipping here about the missing cinema features, but it also mentions all the existing cinema features that I loved about the camera. So these are the official features from the 2.0 update from the Sony website. I'll only be talking about those ones here, which are more relevant to cinema features of course, as well as those ones from the latest update version 3.0. So these are some of the basic cinema features that were missing when it first launched. Then the 2.0 update gave us these ones. Let's break them down super quick. First, time code in, one of the most important features to have in any cinema camera. But Sony seems to have messed it up. I'll tell you why in a second. In case you don't know, time code lets you seamlessly synchronize your camera with professional external audio, as well as sync with other cinema cameras in a multicam setup. You'll need a special cable to use this feature on this camera. I personally haven't tested it, but there's an article from News Shooter that raised some serious red flags about it. It explains how it could be unreliable and risk throwing your timeline off sync, which of course defies the whole purpose of timecode. I felt like Sony didn't really design the camera with timecode in mind, but rather try to force fit it to the camera, probably after getting some heat from calling it cinema camera that lacks a timecode in solution. Going back to the list, adding internal LUTs was a great addition. It helps you preview your treatments and looks live on set along with some other technical benefits of course DPs use them for. It also added the quick menu, aka main menu, which gives access to your basic camera settings and functions at a glance. Something you find in cinema cameras as well, usually on their built-in side screens. Then finally, Cine AI. That's more of a Sony-specific cinema shooting mode that's present in the FX6 and FX9. It's a pretty complex topic involving ISO setting and recording that I won't get into here. But all you need to know is that it helps filmmakers familiar with shooting in this mode on the FX6 and FX9 to seamlessly transition to working with FX3 by just turning this feature on. Now firmware 3.0 is out and tick some more boxes. Let's break them down. We got DCI 4K or Cinema 4K, True 24P, Anamorphic Disk Squeeze, but shutter angle is still missing, which is the first major missed opportunity for becoming a cinema camera. It's pretty absurd, honestly. I mean, after two major updates, they left out this very basic cinema feature. I'm not a programmer, but I'm 100% sure it's a much simpler fix than any of the other features they offered in those updates. But let's just focus on those features and all their disappointing quirks and limitations they have. Starting with DCI 4K. We all know that Ultra HD or 4K has a resolution of 3840 by 2160. As for DCI 4K, it has the same height, but is a bit wider from the sides at 4096 by 2160. DCI stands for Digital Cinema Initiatives, which was decided in 2005 to become the standard resolution and ratio for the film industry for 4K productions. It's not something you have to follow, of course, but it's there to make the industry's life easier. Now I've already seen some YouTubers claim that this update lets DCI 4K give us a wider field of view than in 4K mode, which of course is completely false. Let me show you. Here's a clip shot in 4K. And here's another shot in the new DCI 4K. It's obvious that the image is cropped from top and bottom, not expanded from the sides as they claimed. So each mode has an advantage over the other. If we're talking about field of view, then 4K wins with more coverage from top and bottom. So it has a higher field of view, in terms of height that is. And if you're talking about resolution, then DCI 4K has higher resolution from the sides over 4K. You might say, well why not just shoot in 4K, then in post decide to crop it to DCI 4K, which would also allow you to reframe the shot up and down if you need to adjust the frame. Technically you can, but it's not advisable, since the final resolution you get after cropping is smaller than DCI 4K, and you'll need to upscale your image to fit within the official DCI 4K resolution, which will potentially compromise your image quality to a certain extent. It's a bit minimal though. As a rule of thumb, I'd rather scale down, also known as oversampling, than upscale. Hold that thought since I have a great solution for this later in the episode. 
The second cinematic features we waited two years for is true 24p, but for some odd reason, it's limited to DCI 4K. You cannot shoot in 24p in 4K or Full HD, a limitation that doesn't make any sense. I mean, looking at other popular cameras with cinema features, they offer 24p in all their resolutions with no exceptions. Moving on to anamorphic D-squeeze, in case you don't know, anamorphic lenses, often used in higher value cinematic productions, shoot a stretch image that looks squeezed from the sides. Each lens has a squeeze factor, this one is 1.8 for example. So the anamorphic D-squeeze lets the camera monitor compensate for that stretch and de-squeezes the image to make it look normal again. So it's very good news to bring anamorphic D-squeeze to the FX3, especially that in the past couple of years, many full-frame anamorphic lenses were released with native E-mount, mainly with 1.6 and 1.8 squeeze factors. And the only way to monitor their image properly on the FX3 was to use an external monitor that has the de-squeeze option, like the Ninja 5 for example. Of course you can use a lens adapter to mount PL lenses and open up to more squeeze factor options like 1.3, 1.5, as well as the gold standard of anamorphic, the 2x squeeze factor. Let's organize them in an ascending order. So while I'm very happy that Sony gave us anamorphic de-squeeze, once again, in a typical Sony fashion, it's limited to 1.3 and 2x factors only, which funny enough, ignored the factors from existing lenses with native E-mounts. Of course we can just use 1.3 de-squeeze on 1.5 lenses, it won't look that bad, same with using 2x on 1.8 lenses, but that leaves us with 1.6 right down the middle that would look awkwardly distorted on both 1.3 and the 2x settings. Here's the Su Ray 35mm anamorphic lens with 1.6 squeeze factor, the 2x de squeeze will look extra squeezed as you can see, and the 1.3 de squeeze will look extra stretched. It's pretty much up to you if you won't be too distracted by this distortion. For your reference, this is how it should look like if Sony had a 1.6 de squeeze. So your best bet is to use a monitor that supports those other missing the squeeze factors. Sony should draw some inspiration from Panasonic honestly. It gives us all those other de squeeze options across all S and GH lineups, and they don't claim their cinema cameras while being almost at half the price. But honestly, if Sony really wanted to please the anamorphic crowd, the other major anamorphic feature Panasonic also gave us from day one, and Sony totally ignored in this update, is shooting open gate. That's when the camera uses the full 3x2 sensor area to record your video, which only works in photo mode at the moment. But video mode crops the top and bottom to give you the 16x9 aspect ratio. So if you use a 2x anamorphic lens for example, then this squeeze it in post, you'll get a ridiculously wide frame that looks more like a web banner than a video. But if Sony enables open gate mode, then we'll shoot in the full 3x2 sensor aspect ratio, we'll squeeze those remaining parts of the sensor to get more vertical coverage, then if we de-squeeze it, you'll get a more reasonable wide shot. That's more than 16% taller than the one we have now that shoots on the 16x9 sensor area. It's worth noting the FX3's 3x2 sensor aspect ratio is shorter than the 4x3 sensors traditionally found in other open gate enabled cameras. Moving on to the last feature, lens breathing compensation. Higher end cinema lenses usually don't suffer from breathing when they focus. So that's a feature in lenses basically. One of the reasons why they have much higher price tags but modern cameras use their technology to cheat a bit and digitally compensate for this breathing in cheaper lenses to make them behave like those higher end cinema lenses. This feature already existed in the FX6 and the FX9, so it was time to make it for the FX3. In case you're not familiar with it, this subtle zoom in and out that happens when you rack focus between close and far objects is called lens breathing. It can get pretty distracting with some lenses, like this Sony 85 1.8 lens for example. So when it's turned on, you can see how the zooming effect is completely gone. The first drawback here is that it's only compatible with Sony lenses. You'll find a compatibility list online. But there are some exceptions, like I noticed Sony's f1.8 Nifty 50 is not compatible for example. And of course, all third-party E-mount lenses won't work unfortunately. The second drawback in this feature is, in order for the camera to counter that zooming in and out effect, the camera actually crops the image at different crop factors depending on your focus distance. Let me show you what I mean. Here's the first point of focus when it's off, and here it is when it's on. There's a very subtle crop that happened. You can see it better if I toggle between them. Now check the second point of focus when it's off, then now when it's on, it has a much stronger crop. That's what I meant by different crop factors depending on the focus distance, and that also depends on the lens. Each lens has a different profile for its breathing curve that the camera will follow. So all you need to know is that you have this subtle drop in resolution when you turn it on. Of course the camera will automatically upscale it and you probably won't notice it. This side effect is absolutely normal in breathing compensation on any camera, and it's not Sony's fault. 
The other good news, you can just do this in post with their free Catalyst Browse app. You can see how I can just toggle it on and off from the menu here. And you can actually get more control and fine tune the crop factor in this slider, but only if you pay for their other app, Catalyst Prepare. I didn't pay for it, so I won't be able to show you. So it's good to know you have that much control if you really need it. Also down there, it shows you the before and after resolution of the correction crop. Now the other major point about this update is ProRes RAW. It's not very good news. You know you need the Ninja 5 to record ProRes RAW externally. I already have a couple of episodes that talk about this more in details. They'll explain a couple of important points I'll be mentioning here. So the question is, do any of these features carry over into RAW? Unfortunately, none of them do. We can blame Sony on the DCI 4K and True 24P for not enabling them in the RAW feed. No idea why they did that. Especially that RAW is more likely to be the format of choice for cinema productions, where DCI 4K and 24P are the absolute basic standards in this environment. As for anamorphic disqueeze and breathing compensation, we can blame RAW for that. Again, you can watch this episode to understand the technical reasons. But it's not all bad news though. We already have some easy workarounds I can show you. Let's start with anamorphic disqueeze. Since we'll have to use the Ninja 5 to record ProRes RAW anyway, you can just use its built-in anamorphic disqueeze feature, which is actually better since it already has more disqueeze factors than the ones in the camera. As for DCI 4K, remember when I said that 4K has higher field of view but less resolution than DCI 4K, which has more resolutions on the sides? Well, in ProRes RAW, 4K has the best of both worlds, higher field of view than DCI 4K and higher resolution than both formats. That's because ProRes RAW records the full 1 to 1 pixel width of the sensor without any resizing or oversampling, which is 4240 by 2408. In resolution scale, here's how much smaller internal XEVC 4K recording is compared to RAW. So if you want to get DCI 4K aspect ratio in RAW, you can just crop the top and bottom parts and still end up with enough resolution from the 16 to 9 image from the top and bottom to reframe in post if needed. So to wrap up, the 2.0 update gave us some good cinema features with a quirk, but a good step in the right direction. And with all its good intentions, Sony took another good step in the cinema direction with its 3.0 update, but stumbled when it imposed unnecessary limitations to those features, and left us with a bitter taste when it ignored the most basic cinema feature of them all, the shutter angle. I'd give Sony an A for the effort in trying to give us cinema features, but a C for execution. I really hope they will fix these limitations in future updates. I must admit, those features got the FX3 closer than ever to qualify as a cinema camera on paper, but those quirks and limitations stopped it short from being a true cinema camera where it really matters, on an actual film set. I won't deny it's still one of my most favorite cameras I've ever used, but for completely different reasons. Hope you liked this episode, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.